Hey everybody, welcome to today's word. I kick off, I, I launch it with a question for you. Did you ever get caught cheating in school? Yeah, did you ever get caught cheating in school? I don't know why, I don't know how, I thank the good Lord, and maybe it was just good old fear of punishment, but I never developed the habit of cheating in school. Now, here's the thing, and why I bring this up is not to go, ah, you're a cheater, you're no good, it's a lie when you cheat, and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, <sighs> The actual honest admonition there is you're only cheating yourself. If you don't learn, it doesn't hurt anyone except you. But back to the thing. I'm about to illustrate with this thought of cheating in school, okay? Here you sit with a test paper. Boom. You have to fill in these answers. But instead of you filling it in, you look over here where someone else is filling it in. And you look over, you read what they wrote, and you copy what they wrote. Now, the problem with that is the teacher, number one, during the test is looking around and she might notice that one student is writing while another student is reading. And there's a difference on children's expressions when they're writing and when they're reading. The teacher sees it and calls them out. But even if the teacher has settled back behind the desk for a long winter's nap, not saying teachers do that, but they're not watching. Even if you're cunning and coy enough not to be seen cheating off someone else's paper, while you're in this process, you don't know the answers. So you're taking for granted that the person over here's answers are going to get you to pass the test. And when the teacher's grading a paper, they see a misspelled word. Hmm, this student misspelled a word on line two. And then they see your paper and they go, hmm, this student misspelled the exact same word and misspelled it the exact same way. That's interesting. And then they go, this student got number one, number two, number three, and number four right, and number five wrong. And this student who spelled everything the exact same way got number one, number two, number three, and number four right, and number five wrong, exactly the same. <sighs> the teacher starts to smell a problem. The student must be cheating because they're copying the person next to them. The problem with cheating is multifaceted and you're blessed when you're caught because it breaks you from that dangerous habit and you go about your own learning. But not in cheating, but in life. Not on a graded test paper where we're supposed to come up with the answers that we learned during class and put them on the paper. But in life, we're looking at the paper we're looking at the lifestyle, we're looking at the attitude, and we're copying it. And in today's word, we're going to see where what we're copying down is all the errors and all the misspellings and all the wrong judgments of those who are shadowing an influence over us that aren't centered in the Holy Word of God. You're about to see how your life can be set free because you're all done cheating yourself. Join me in today's word.
We're looking into God's Word today, and we're exploring the prophet Zechariah. Now, Zechariah was given the Word of God so that he could give a warning to his nation and uh, tell them that this generation is the turn it around generation that they were the ones who were going to see some things happen that for a long time hadn't been happening or hadn't been happening correctly or well he's calling for a strong return to the true worship of god and putting aside the foolishness and no longer patterning after some of the things they'd been seeing patterned around them, but rather patterning the victory God was going to release over them. Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 1 is where we'll embrace God's word today. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido, the prophet, saying, the Lord, listen to this declaration, verse 2, Zechariah 1. The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. I'll repeat the reading. The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Because of this, or therefore, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of the hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Now, it's interesting to note here, after verse number two, where he says, hey, don't be like your fathers. That's hard to hear. We all mimic and copy many things from the generation in front of us. And God gives the word to Zechariah, do not be like your fathers. Why? Because there's two things there's two specific things noted about their behavior in Zechariah verse one, chapter 1 and verse 4. The Bible says there's two things noted about them. They're noted for not hearing, not enough interests in them for spiritual things to listen. And the second thing is not hearkening or they did not act on that which was being said so so catch what the scripture saying don't be like them they didn't care to hear the word of god but what they did hear they didn't act on it god says i'm sore displeased i'm sore i'm feeling pain i'm displeased it takes pleasure away from God. I'm sore displeased. Zacharites, your fathers, those before you, have displeased the Lord. They didn't listen to the Lord, but when they did happen to hear something from the Lord, they refused to act on it. He declares, do not be like them in verse 4. Our second passage of observation comes from the wisdom of Psalms. Our second passage of biblical admonition found in the wisdom from Psalms. We look at the word of God and see Psalm 49 beginning in verse 10. He seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool... And the brutish person perisheth, and they leave their wealth to others. 
Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever. Their dwelling, the place they live, for all generations, they call their lands after their own name. Now the psalmist here says what he sees is the wise, the fool, and the brutish. And no matter what the person is like, they die. They see this, the best and the worst die. They see it, and when they die, they see their wealth pass hands. Everybody sees this. Big wealth, small wealth, little wealth, little of nothing. A person dies, and everything that they had changes hands. But verse 11 is that their thought, they think differently than the reality that they see. This is delusional. This is denial. There is a cognitive disorder. They think differently than everything they're seeing. When they see an absolute truth, what they choose to think upon doesn't line up with that absolute truth. So no matter how crazy their thinking is, verse number 12 says, Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. This their way is their folly. They think different than the reality that they see. This is their folly. Yet their posterity approve their sayings, Selah. Yet, yet, yet. Despite the fact, the big yeti in the room, if you will, yet, despite the fact that men die and their wealth, all their wealth passes to other hands, their inward thought is continuum. This goes on forever. No matter what level of honor you achieve in this life, like a beast you perish, this way of thinking, feeling, and living, verse 12, is complete folly. There's a lack of sense. There's a stupidity to it. Everybody dies. Death passed upon all men for all have sinned. Everything passes to other hands to be controlled. This is a Bible fact. Yet in the midst of these facts, their thinking is continuum. Their thinking is everything continues as it is. In this, their way is stupidity. They're absolutely dumb about this. Yet, the big monster, the Yeti in the room, is that while they're stupid about this, Psalm 49, 13, it says, yet, the big Yeti, yet their posterity approve of their sayings. Even though this is absolute stupidity, their posterity, all future generations, their daughters, their sons, their grandchildren, those who come after them, they approve. We're going to be stupid just like you. Wow. Zachariah, I know your life you've been copying somebody. Don't be like them. The psalmist, they're so stupid. They think it's going to continue endlessly, yet everybody dies. And the Yeti monster, their children approve, their children go with the same foolishness. So let's figure out how to kill the Yeti monster. How we can be breaking from this foolishness. Zechariah warned us. The psalmist warned us. How do we break the pattern? The wisdom to break from this. How do we live in victory and get in line with the good word of God from the wise man, Zechariah? 
Third stop on our Bible journey, Matthew chapter 10. We come to the words of Jesus himself because we have a multi-generational problem. Zechariah said, your fathers made God sore and displeased. Don't be like them. The psalmist said, the, your, your, your fathers are stupid. They're living a delusional life. Yet the next generation approves of what they're doing. So we come to the words of Jesus to break that yet, to kill that yet e monster and set ourselves free. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 37, the light of the world, Jesus lights this issue for us. Jesus said, think not, don't think, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Think not, the Lord Jesus says, that I am come to send peace on the earth. I didn't come to send peace. I came to be a sword. Swords are pokey. Swords are sharp. Swords are for war. Swords are serious. Battle, warfare, sword. Not peace, but a sword. Jesus said, I didn't come for peace or agreement. Peace accords, we know of. Peace agreements. A peace accord, a peace agreement is when they end a war, they bring everybody to the same position. Everybody's on the same side. Jesus said, don't think I've come to agree with everything. I've come to start a war. I've come to bring you to another side. I, I don't agree with everything going on. I, I don't leave it the way it is. I, I, I'm changing some things. I, I'm not in harmony and agreement. So when the psalmist said those, those people are doing stupid, yeah, Jesus disagrees with that. When, when Zechariah said, don't be like them, Jesus disagrees with that. Jesus agrees with that. Jesus says, don't think I'm on the same page. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. I'm not come to bring peace with certain things. Rather, pokey pokey, in comes the sword. The battlefront, the line of disagreement. Jesus is not at peace with everything. The quote you could probably give to the Lord Jesus that he never said, but he basically said it right here is, it's not all good. Most people, it's all good. It's all good. Jesus, it's not all good. I'm not here to be in agreement with. I'm here to be contend with. I'm a sword. I'm not at peace with it. Zachariah said it this way, God is sore and displeased. Sore displeased, extremely painfully displeased. So Jesus begins to give us the issue of disagreement. Where does he not side with foolishness and stupidity? Verse 35, Matthew 10. I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Now, variance is a difference or an inconsistency. In other words, because of Jesus, you just may not line up with them anymore. Parents are going to line up, as the psalmist said, with stupidity. They're, they're going to be like, everything goes on forever. Most people will agree and do the same thing. That's the Yeti monster. Zechariah said, don't be like them. Why? They're, they're different and inconsistent with Jesus. Jesus said, I'm not at peace with people close to you. They are inconsistent with me. Then in Matthew 10, verse 36, he says it plainly. Listen to Matthew 10, 36. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. You're going to have relative or family close proximity, people issues. Blood relatives will be your foes. 
a foe, an enemy, an opponent. They're going to be the opposite. The best way to describe foe is that old expression, are you friend or foe? If you're my friend, approach. If you're a foe, go away. You're an enemy. A man's foes, a man's enemies, those who oppose him will be they of his own house. Relatives, close proximity. Jesus said, those in your house, your family, they're going to be your foe. Wow. Zechariah said, don't be like them. The psalmist said, they agree with their stupid, delusional ways. Jesus said, they're your foe, they're your enemies, they're your opponents. Now I'm going to show you how to kill this monster once and for all. Verse 37, Matthew 10 does just that. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus gives us once and for all the answer we need. Now here's the giant Yeti monster leading your life to destruction, agreeing with and accepting their stupidity. Zachariah says, don't be like them. Jesus says, there's a sword, poke. We're not at peace. We're not in agreement with this. And then he says, when he says they're about love, he's talking about the devotion, the copying, and the esteeming. Respect and mimicking. He that loveth father or mother more than me. More than me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me. He literally says, if we respect father and mother, mimic them more than Jesus. Now, the truth is we all mimic father and mother. It's an undeniable fact. You know, if only we could mimic some of the good stuff mama did. Some of you are like, man, if I could just mimic mama's recipes, I'd be the cook of all time. But Jesus said... You have esteem, you have respect, you mimic them more than me. So when Jesus says, lay up your treasure in heaven, and dad and mom say, as the psalmist described, we live like we were never going to die, as delusional as that is, that delusional thinking doesn't match reality. Who do we run to more, Jesus or them? When, when the false teachers rise up and with their blistering arrogance say false things and in their confidence try to sway your way of thinking, who gets esteemed, Jesus or them? You know, when people lay aside the authority of the church and do their own thing, be careful of them. Never be part of things outside of the authority of your church. God moves inside the flow of his church. There'll be false teachers who tell you things like, well, you can lose your own salvation. Guess what? If I could lose it, it would long be lost. It would surely be gone. It's not held by my devotion. My salvation is not held nor maintained by my devotion. I am held by the Father's hand. Let me repeat that. My salvation, if it could be lost, I would have long lost it long ago. I'm not held by my devotion. I'm held by the Father's hand. John chapter 10. I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Eternal means lasting eternally. Okay. Never perish means never. Never means at no time in the present or past or future. On no occasion, not ever. Perish means 
biblically separation from God. If that isn't convincing enough, neither shall what? Neither shall any man, zero of mankind, nobody can, not you, not me, not anybody, no man, no mankind can do what? Pluck them out of my hand. Nobody, including you, can pluck, pick, pull, disconnect, or remove, undo the connection out of where? Jesus' hand. Wow. The truth of being born again and secure in the power of Christ. Do you esteem them more than me, Jesus said. Zechariah, God is displeased with your fathers. Why, why Zechariah? Why, why aren't we supposed to be like our fathers? Because they didn't pay attention to hearing the word of God. And when they did happen upon the word of God and hear some of it, they couldn't be bothered to act on it. Wow, that's powerful. You know, esteem Jesus in his true words. So when those of the household, those of your family, those examples of your parents, those that we mimic, those that we respect, when we see this, we understand it's wrong, it's stupid, as the psalmist said. We side with Jesus. Jesus said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Parents, siblings, friends, co-workers, others say, follow me, it's football season. You know, those people, while it's a fun circus to watch, just like old P.T. Barnum with his carnival hucksters and sideshows, showing off freaks and oddities for people to see. They put on a pretty good circus. But listen to me. Your team dominating for a decade or your team sloshing around in last place. Listen to me. I'm, I'm talking about a sports fan and it's football season. Your team dominating for a decade or sloshing around in last place has zero meaning for all eternity. Now think about this. The owner of that team is rich and you're not. <laughs> He's gonna die and some other carny will take it up and run that sideshow. And he'll dress up his actors in new costumes and off they go again. They're not thinking that it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. I'm telling you, your all-access sports package might just be working against the voice of God in your life. That's right. Your all-access sports package. I got every game now. It may just be working against the voice of God in your life. Think of it. You'll miss church. Listen to what I'm saying right here. You'll miss church and think nothing of it. And yet if somebody were to come in and turn off the game, you'd jump out of your skin because you'll miss part of a play. You'd be screaming. But you'll get game day tickets and skip church. Oh, those have real value. These are valuable tickets. You haven't killed the Yeti monster, have you? You're stuck back in Psalms. I approve of their sayings. God's word over what others say. God's word over some carnival. You know, let me, let me just say something here. And I know I'm coming out strong about football, but football has come out strong against the Lord's Day. And I'm not being tit for tat. I'm telling you, football is warring against your spiritual soul. The carnival of sport, whatever it is, it's all passing nonsense. Here's the importance check, and I want you to hear this. It's an importance check. 36 months ago, a three, 
a simple three years. That's it, three years. Three years ago today, what was your team doing? Three years ago today, what was your team doing? Did they win? Who did they play? I mean, within 36 months, most of you have no idea to the questions I just asked. Right? You have no idea. It mattered during that carnival show at that moment. But what about right now? It's a whole new season with different players, different schedules, different program. So the football game that was the pinnacle of your attention 36 months ago, three short seasons, I don't remember. I don't know who they were playing. I don't know the score. I don't know who did what. Three short years. But when somebody got saved three short years ago and their name was written forever in heaven, they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of the Father's hand. It still matters. Let that truth bomb go off on you and feel it right now. Jesus said, you're pattering after foolishness and you're getting the worst results. You love this more than me. You know what he's talking about there? When you love father and mother more than me, you esteem them higher than Jesus. Zechariah said, don't be like your fathers. They didn't pay attention to the word of God, and when they happened upon God's truth, they ignored it. The psalmist said they're delusional and they esteem things like life will go on forever and how sad and stupid, but the Yeti monster, their children approve of their sayings. And Jesus said, I'm going to break you from that monster. Love me more. Love my truth more. Love my church more. Let me explain what he says when he says, loving more than me. I love it. I've learned from Adam how to really get results training the dogs. It's a good thing. I love it. I mean, imagine a dog that obeys. Takes me back in time to when Martha Stewart was on TV. It's a good thing. A dog that obeys. It's so great. So the dog listens and does what I say with relatively good obedience. I mean, it's pretty cool. Like I can say things and the dog will do it. Now, I mean, I'm not ready to go on national TV. I'm not ready to take this show on the road, but it's just really cool to have a dog that listens to what you say. I mean, I can actually get open the door and get them to go out of the house into the yard. And I can open the door again and get them out of the yard and come back in the house just because I'm saying it. That's really pretty cool. So I'm giving the dog a command and she's starting to obey. I'm liking this. Ooh, this is nice. I mean, this, this is goodish dog behavior when when in the winds of life, right? The winds of life, when something comes up. I'm giving the dog a command and she's starting to obey me. When Adam comes in the room. When Adam comes into the room, the dog who was starting to obey me her attention shoots over to him and she runs at his feet and she sits down and she looks up at him like my master is here nobody else matters Jesus said when you esteem them and their words more than me when there's a conflicting command 
the way of the world, the way of the cross. When there's a conflicting command, the way of the false teacher, the way of the word of God. Who, who are you going to hear? Jesus said, your family, they might pull you away from church. Love and respect me more. Jesus said, your family, they, they might drink and do foolish things. Love and respect me more. Jesus said, your family might just only teach you how to live for the here and now, but I'm teaching you how to live and respect my kingdom more. The voices are there. Which one will we follow?